My dear fellow, said Sherlock Holmes as we sat on either side of the fire in his lodgings at Baker Street, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive the things which are really mere commonplaces of existence. If we could fly out of that window hand in hand, hover over this great city, gently remove the roofs, and peep in at the queer things which are going on, the strange coincidences, the plannings, the cross-purposes, the wonderful chains of events, working through generation and leading to the most utterly results, would make all fiction of its conventionalities and foreseen conclusions most stale and unprofitable. And yet I'm not convinced of it, I answered. The cases which come to light in the papers are as a rule bold enough and vulgar enough. We have in our police reports realism pushed to its extreme limits. And yet the result is, I must confess, neither fascinating nor artistic. A certain selection and discretion must be used in producing a realistic effect, remarked Holmes. This is wanting in the police report, which more more stress is laid, perhaps upon the platitudes of the magistrate than upon the details, to which an observer can tame the vital sense of the whole matter. Depend upon it, there is nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. I smiled and shook my head. I can quite understand your thinking so, I said. Of course, in your position of unofficial adviser and helper to everybody who is absolutely puzzled, for our free continents, you are brought in contact with all that is strange and bizarre. But here, I picked up the morning paper from the ground. Let us put it to a practical test. Here is the first heading upon which I come, a husband's cruelty to his wife. There is half a column of print, but I know without reading it that it is all perfectly familiar to me. There is, of course, the other woman, the drink, the push, the blow, the bruise, the sympathetic sister or landlady. The crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude. <laughs> Indeed, your example is an unfortunate one for your argument, said Holmes, taking the paper, glancing his pa eye down it. This is the Dundas separation case, and as it happens, I was engaged in clearing up some small points in connection with it. The husband was a teetotaler, there was no other woman, and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife, which, you allow, is not an action likely to occur to the imagination of the average storyteller. Take a pinch of snuff, Doctor, and acknowledge that I have scored over you in your example. He held out his snuff-box of old gold, with a great amethyst in the centre of the lid. Its splendour was in such contrast to his homely ways and simple life that I could not help commenting upon it. Ah, said he, I had forgotten that you had not seen you for some weeks. It is a little souvenir from the King of Bohemia in return for my assistance in the case of the Irina Adler papers. And the ring? I asked, glancing at a remarkable brilliance which sparkled upon his finger. It is from the reigning family of Holland. Though in the matter in which I served them was of such delicacy that I cannot confide it even to you who have been good enough to chronicle one or two of my little problems. And have you any on hand just now? I asked with interest. Some ten or twelve, but none which present any feature of interest. They are important, you understand, without being interesting. Indeed, I have found that it is usually in unimportant matters that there is a field for the observation, and for the quick analysis of cause and effect, which gives the charm to an investigation. The larger crimes are apt to be the simpler, for the bigger the crime, the more obvious, as a rule, is the motive. In these cases, save for one rather intricate matter, which has been referred to me from Marseille, there is nothing which presents any feature of interest. It is possible, however, that I may have something better before very many minutes is over. For this is one of my clients, so I am much mistaken.
He had risen from his chair and was standing between the party of blinds, gazing down into the dull, neutral-tinted London street. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a large woman with a heavy fur boa round her neck and a large curling red feather in her broad-brimmed hat, which was tilted in a coquettish Duchess of Devonshire fashion over her ear. From under this great panoply, she peeped in in a nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward, and her fingers fidgeted with her glove buttons. Suddenly, with a plunge, as of the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road, and we heard the sharp clang of the bell. "I have seen these symptoms before," said Holmes, throwing a cigarette into the fire. "Oscillation upon the pavement always means a affair de coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure that the matter is not too delicate for communication." Yet even here we may discriminate. Well, when a woman has been seriously wronged by a man, she no longer oscillates, and the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here we may take it that there is a love matter, but that the maiden is not so much angry as perplexed or grieved. But here she comes in person to resolve our doubts. As he spoke, there was a tap at the door, and the boy in buttons entered to announce Miss Mary Sutherland, while the lady herself loomed behind a small black figure like a full-sailed merchantman behind a tiny pilot boat. Sherlock Holmes welcomed her with the easy courtesy for which he was remarkable, and having closed the door and bowed her into an armchair, he looked her over in the minute yet abstracted fashion which was peculiar to him. "'Did you not find,' he said, "'that with your short sight it is a little trying to do so much typing?' "'I did at first, she answered. "'But I know now where the letters are about looking.' Then suddenly, realising the full purport of his words, she gave a violent start and looked up, with fear and astonishment upon her broad, good-humoured face. "'You've heard about me, Mr. Holmes,' she cried. "'Else how could you know all that?' "'Never mind,' said Holmes, laughing. "'It is my business to know things. Perhaps I have trained myself to see what others overlook. If not, why should you come to consult me?' "'I came to you, sir, because I heard of you from Mrs. Etheridge, whose husband you found so easy when the police and every one had given him up for dead. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I wish you would do as much for me.' I'm not rich, but I still have a hundred a year in my own right, besides the little that I make by the machine, and I would give it all to know what has become of Mr. Osmer Angel. Why did you come away to consult me in such a hurry? asked Sherlock Holmes, with his fingertips together, his eyes to the ceiling. Again a startled look came over the somewhat vacuous face of Miss Mary Sutherland. Yes, I did bang out of the house, she said, for it made me angry to see the easy way in which Mr. Windybank, that is, my father, took it all. He would not go to the police, and he would not go to you. And so at last he would do nothing, and kept on saying that there was no harm done. It made me mad, and just um, went my pangs, and came away to you. Your father, said Holmes. Your stepfather, surely, since the name is different. Yes, my stepfather. I call him father, though it sounds funny, too, for he is only five years and two months older than myself. And your mother is alive? Well, yes, mother is alive and well. I wasn't best pleased, Mr. Holmes, when she married again so soon after father's death, and a man who was nearly fifteen years younger than herself. Father was a plumber in the Tottenham Court Road, and he left a tidy business behind him, which mother carried on with Mr. Hardy, the foreman. But when Mr. Windybank came, he sell, made us sell the business, for he was very superior being a traveller in wines. They got forty-seven hundred pounds for the goodwill and interest, which wasn't as near as much as father could have got if he had been alive. I had expected to see Sherlock Holmes impatient under this rambling and inconsequential narrative, but on the contrary he had listened with the greatest concentration of attention. "'Your own little income?' he asked. "'Does it come out of the business?' "'Oh, no, sir. It is quite separate and was left me by my Uncle Ned in Elkland. It is in New Zealand stock, paying four and a half per cent. Two thousand five hundred pounds was the amount, but I can only touch the interest.' "'You interest me very extremely.' said Holmes, and since you draw so large a sum as a hundred a year, with what you earn into the bargain, you no doubt travel a little and indulge yourself in every way. I believe that a single lady can get on very nicely upon an income of about sixty pounds. I could do with much less than that, Mr. Holmes, but you understand that as long as I live at the home, I don't wish to be a burden to them, and so they have use of the money just while I'm staying with them. Of course, that is only just for the time. Mr. Windybank draws my interest every quarter and pays it over to Mother, and I find that I can do pretty well with my what I earn at typewriting. It brings me tuppence a sheet, and I can often do from tw fifteen to twenty sheets in a day. You have made your position very clear to me, said Holmes. 
Oh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson, before whom you may can speak freely as before myself. Kindly tell us now all about your connection with Miss Hosmer Angel. A flush stole over Miss Sutherland's face, and she picked nervously at the fringe of her jacket. I met him first at the gas fitters' ball, she said. They used to send father tickets when he was alive, and then afterwards they remembered us and sent them to mother. Mr. Windybank did not wish us to go. He never did wish us to go anywhere. He would get quite mad if I wanted to join a Sunday school treat. But this time I was set on going, and I would go, for what right had he to prevent? He said the folk were not fit for us to know, when all father's friends were to be there. And he said that I had nothing fit to wear when I had my purple plush that I had never so much as taken out of the drawer. At last, when nothing else would do, he went off to France to upon the business of the firm. But we went, Mother and I, with Mr. Hardy, who used to be our foreman, and it was there that I met Mr. Hosmer Angel. I suppose, said Holmes, that when Mr. Windybank came back from France, he was very annoyed at your having gone to your ball. Oh, well, he was very good about it. He laughed, I remember, and shrugged his shoulders, and said there was no use denying anything to a woman, for she would have her own way. I see. Then at the gas fitter's ball you met, I, as I understand, a gentleman called Mr. Hosmer Angel. Yes, sir. I met him that night, and he called next day to ask if we had got home all safe. And after that we had met him, that is to say, Mr. Holmes, I met him twice for walks, but after that father came back again, and Mr. Hosmer Angel could not come to the house any more. No? Well, you know, father didn't like anything of the sort. He wouldn't have any visitors if he could help it and he used to say that a woman should be happy in her own family circle. But then, I, as I used to say to her mother, a woman wants her own circle to begin with, and I had not got mine yet. But how about Mr. Hosmer Angel? Did he make no attempt to see you? Well, father was going off to France again in a week, and Hosmer wrote and said that it would be safer and better not to see each other until he had gone. We could write in the meantime, and he used to write every day. I took the letters in in the morning, so there was no need for father to know. Were you engaged to the gentleman at this time? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. We were engaged after the first walk that we took. Hosmer, Mr. Angel, was a cashier in the office in Leadenhall Street, and... What office? That's the worst of it, Mr. Holmes. I don't know. Where did he live, then? He slept on the premises. And you don't know his address? No, except that it was Leadenhall Street. Where did you address your letters, then? to the Leadenhall Street Post Office, to be left till court for. He said that if they were sent to the office, he would be chaffed by all the other clerks about having letters from the lady. So I offered to typewrite them like he did his, but he wouldn't have that, for he said that when I wrote them, they seemed to come from me, but when they were typewritten, he, would, he always felt that the machine had come between us. That will just show you how fond he was of me, Mr. Holmes, and the little things that he would think of. It was most suggestive, said Holmes. It has long been an axiom of mine that the little things are infinitely the most important. Can you remember any other little things about Mr. Hosmer Angel? He was a very shy man, Mr. Holmes. He would rather walk with me in the evening than in the daylight, for he said that he hated to be conspicuous. Very retiring and gentlemanly he was. Even his voice was gentle. He had had the quinsy and swollen glands when he was young, he told me, and it had left him with a weak throat and a hesitating, whispering fashion of speech. He was always well-dressed, very neat and plain, but his eyes were weak, just as mine are, and he wore tinted glasses across the glare. Well, and what happened when Mr. Windybank, your stepfather, returned to France? Mr. Hosmer Angel came to the house again and proposed that we should marry before father came back. He was in a dreadful earnest and made me swear with my hands on the testament that whatever happened I would always be true to him. Mother said he was quite right to make me swear and that it was a sign of his passion. Mother was all in his favour from the first, and was even fond of her of him than I was. Then, when they talked of marrying within the third week, I began to ask about father, but they both said never to mind about father, but just tell him afterwards, and Mother said she would make it all right with him. I didn't quite like that, Mr. Holmes. It seemed funny that I should ask his leave, as he was only a few years older than me. But I didn't want to do anything on the sly, so I wrote to father at Boudoir where the company had its French offices, but the letter came back to me on the very morning of the wedding. It missed him, then? Yes, sir, for he had started to England just before it arrived. Ah, that was unfortunate. Your wedding was arranged then for the Friday. Was it to be in church? Yes, sir, but very quietly. It was to be at St. Saviour's near King's Cross, and we were to have breakfast afterwards at the St. Pancras Hotel. 
Hosmer came for us in a hansom, but as there were two of us, he put both of us into it and stepped into a four-wheeler.